lovers, I am Kay Ryan Hennessy and I am going to share with you my tips for staying inspired through adversity or really for any time. Uh, I am an artist born to the area and living locally in West Hollywood now for the last 10 years. Uh, at present, I have works on display here in Los Angeles and internationally in Guangzhou, China, uh, which was very exciting for me this year, despite all the things happening around us. Um, my practice is largely on canvas and paper supports, often incorporating transparent media such as watercolor and ink with paper collage. Um, but I also believe that a capital A artist really has to flex and expand what they do and who they are. Uh, and so I, I jumped headfirst practice-wise into uh, installation and performance art thanks to guidance from some wonderful friends such as Kayla Clunan, who you're going to hear from, and Miss Art World, who's helping to put this all together in her role for the city of Santa Clarita. I also serve as the president of TAG, a 27-year-old gallery cooperative on Los Angeles's Miracle Mile. Our artist co-op hosts 13 different events over the course of every year. Uh, one of those is a national jury to exhibition and another is a statewide jury to ex exhibition and both of those are contests with cash prizes. Um, and we also show 40 different artist solo exhibitions, variety of group shows and member curated opportunities. Um, so we have a lot of programming going on. It's really fun. Um, both myself and TAG, the, uh, the gallery, have connections with the Santa Clarita Valley. I personally work for the cruise lines uh, at the Princess offices, serving across the brands for tour imagery uh, and descriptions in a marketing setting. Uh, and also one of our TAG members is a resident of the Santa Clarita Valley. Uh, and we're very excited to have her in the gallery and very excited to have that link with all of you there in the city. You can discover more about me and more about Tag Gallery by following the links that I put down here on the screen. So uh, thank you. And uh, now let's dive into it. How do we stay inspired? Um, there are lots of ways to stay inspired. Um, and most of them are not nearly as organized, uh, especially for me personally when I'm practicing as what I'm about to present to you. Uh, but roll with it. Organization's fun and we can enjoy it. Um, the, in my experience though, I find that inspiration, like love and patience, power and confidence, they come from inside of us. There's something that we dredge up within ourselves. Um, and because they're emotionally based in that way, they require feeding. We have to do things to make emotion really grow inside of us uh, and, and expand. Uh, and so I do have five tips uh, for staying organized, and they are to organize and prioritize. They're to uh, get out there and create an art routine for yourself, to connect Create creatively, to care for yourself, and to make something, really, to make anything. So let's dive in and start with number one, organize and prioritize. Order, at least for me, is particularly important right now because of how impacted our lives have become. My own world, just like yours, has shrunk dramatically. Uh, I've grown very used to having corporate offices that I can go to, having my private studio at the gallery that I can work in and display art in, and well, let's face it, go hide. Um, and also having a studio here at home that's part of a shared home office with my partner. Um, and now all three of those spaces are combined here into this one area. And as you can see, I've got my desk set up, my work computer's here at the floor running the PowerPoint. My personal computer is what's recording along with the phones and iPads in every corner. And so organizing and prioritizing is really important because there's so much that, that might be on your plate, as I know there's certainly a lot on mine. 
So what I'm going to do now is show you how to prioritize your time using a simple drawing exercise that anybody can do. We're basically going to make a circle and cut it up into parts and color it in. Um, but in order to do that, you're going to need a piece of paper. You're going to need a pencil. You can have crayons, markers, uh, anything like that if you'd like, if you want to color code, but that's not necessary. All you really need to do this exercise is have a pencil and a piece of paper or your iPad and your finger, whatever it is that works for you. So once you have your materials ready, you're going to draw a circle on the page. Uh, and make it nice and big, fill up the whole page with your circle, go ahead and, and give yourself room. And then we're going to divide that circle into eight segments. Um, first, you're going to cut it in half from top to bottom, so from the top to the bottom, and then from left to right, doing the same thing. So now you have four big wedges. And then in order to get your eight wedges, we're going to go from the diagonal, left to right, and then from the diagonal, top to bottom, right to left. And now we're going to take our wedge and we're going to label the parts of your wedge with the things that might be most important in your life. And you're going to pick eight things that are really, really important to you. Examples might include art, work, family, romance, faith or religion, travel, relaxation, health, etc. But whatever those eight things that you most want to focus and prioritize on in your life, those are the things that you want to focus on for this exercise. So go ahead and pick what your wedges are going to be and fill them out now. All right, great job. So I've got my wedges and my wedges are sleep, relax, other, art, work, gallery, exercise, and social. And you should replace these with your own important topics. They can be anything, again, anything that's important to you and, and what helps to shape your life. Now we're going to get to the fun part and we're going to fill in the areas based on how you would grade yourself, right? So you're going to, you're going to take your circle and from the inside of your circle radiating outward, you're going to color in. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and give it as a start with sleep. And I'm sleeping pretty well. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm staying up a little late, but I'm still getting in my time. Um, and that's okay because I don't have to wake up quite as early as I normally do. And I'm still getting in my nap. So I feel good about sleep. I'm going to fill in the whole wedge. Nice and comfortable with it. Now, relaxation, when I get there, eh, it's a little bit harder. It's harder to do the things that I would normally do out in the world to relax because we're not going out into the world. And I really don't have a lot of time considering all the other areas that have been impacted. So maybe that's a place I can work on. And I know that by not fully coloring in the wedge. I'm going to move on. Art's pretty good. I'm going to fill that in about one third of the way. Um, and I, I like how art's going. It's I've been pretty constant and I have been for the last few years. I, I, I have a daily practice that I stick with. Um, so I'm, I'm good with it. Uh, you know, give it a nice fill. There's always room for more. Now work, that's a completely different story. Uh, work is kind of overwhelming now, needing a lot of attention and that's okay. In life, some things are going to switch and they're going to change. And finding balance isn't about giving everything an equal portion of time. Finding balance is really finding the way in which you can feel comfortable with the attention that everything's getting and still responding in a way that's good and healthy for you. Uh, so even though work is a lot right now, that's okay. I'm, I'm happy to be working and I've got something to keep me occupied, to keep me busy. So I'm good with it. Gallery is the same way. It's taking up a lot more space than it used to in my life. Um, as president, that's expected. When crisis happens, you need to be there to respond and to be able to do the right thing. And that's what, what's happening right now. I'm doing a good job with it, but it is taking a good deal of time. So I'm going to fill it in because it's getting a good amount of attention. When I move to exercise, though, 
I'm not exercising at all. Not even my little walks that I normally do during the day are happening. Um, so I'm not going to give myself any coloring for, for exercise. I'm just going to leave a little dot in there and move on. Social's also pretty low for me. Uh, and so in the social area, I'm going to judge it low. And this is an area that tells me I need to improve. Um, and it's something that's really important to me, something that helps feed my inspiration. So maybe I'll start thinking about ways that I can up my social game uh, and, and start to decrease some of the more serious uh, aspects that are taking place with the gallery and work. Uh, and then the other space. I always put in other space for myself personally uh, in all of my lists and that's just because life is going to throw whatever it wants to throw at us, whether it be a global pandemic or, you know, just some small thing, you, you, dealing with um, uh, paying your bills or the taxes, you know, I've been avoiding those for sure. That's what happens when you get to put them off till July. Um, so this is what my uh, wedges look like and my time. And now that I, I have the big picture of what I'm doing with my time and how I feel about my time, it allows me to make judgments and you can do that for yourself as well. Um, these judgments are how you reflect on what the chart is showing you. Um, does your map reveal, for instance, that you're not paying as much attention to your family that you would like, or um, that maybe you're uh, not as focused on your art practice as you'd like to be? And where can you find adjustments? Where can you pivot to respond in the way that is best, again, for you? Uh, I can see in mine that, you know, social is really an area that I could use some improvement and exercise as well. Um, I think I'll target social, go in small, one bite-sized piece at a time uh, first, and maybe I'll start doing some conference, uh, some uh, uh, video calls with family members and friends while I cook dinner, for instance. You know, I'm sequestered there in the kitchen, and even though it's a little noisy, there's still enough room to talk and have some fun with somebody while I bounce around. So now it's your turn. Go ahead and do the same thing. Draw out your map and, and reflect. What are the things that are important to you and how can you adjust to feed your own personal inspiration? Be sure to make these small adjustments over time. Um, they will definitely help you as you want to build and grow in your art practice. Now, there are a few, uh, there are actually millions of ways that you can add order into your life, but I'm going to just throw out a few other tips, um, things that I like to impose order, to, which, which feed that part of inspiration that's, that's driven by organization and prioritization. Make your bed every day. Clean your workspace, your cupboards, your closets. When you have an organized space around you, you're able to work more freely. Eat breakfast. It sets the tone for your day, it makes you feel good, and it's orderly. Cook a meal. Cooking a meal is like imposing order out of chaos. You're literally taking the chaos of ingredients and following a pattern in order to create something beautiful. It truly is inspiring work to just basically cook. And make a list. Lists are great things. They help impose order in the mind, which relaxes you and gets you inspired. All right, let's move on to number two, create an art routine. Like organizing and prioritizing, routines are a great way to get inspired. Uh, human my minds are hardwired for routine. We find them comforting, we find them relaxing, and they allow our thoughts to quiet and be still so that we can explore, problem solve, and create those three great seeds of inspiration. I, I once have, well, I still have this artist friend um, who was very prolific in grad school. She made tons of art and it was really exciting and inspiring. But afterwards, when she was out on her own, um, she, she told me that, it, that artwork just wasn't coming. She said, it used to fly out of me, but now it's like there's nothing left at all. Um, and what we found when we reflected is that artist was really lost in the lack of routine. 
After some discussion about what was different in her life during grad school and what was happening now, we discovered that she really, really was just missing the schedules and the deadlines that classes provided. Uh, and so we built some based around art calls that were out there and a couple of goals that she had in mind for herself creatively. And we just set goals, whether they were arbitrary or matched something. And suddenly, within a matter of days, she was producing artwork again at a high level. She was very excited about it and having fun. And that's really the most important part, right? Is to create art so that we can be personally satisfied and possibly share our experience with the experiences with those around us in the world. So you can set some routines by establishing a space to work, time to work and building on those habits. And the way of thinking about it is that space plus time equals habit. And when you reinforce it over and over again, those things are going to become part of your routine. Um, so space to work. Set up a small area to do your work. This can be a table or a desk. It can be as large as a whole room, maybe even your garage if you're lucky enough to have that and define it as your art space. Make sure that the others that are in your life understand that this is where you're going to create. Be sure to avoid clutter in these areas. You wanna make sure that it is dedicated just to you and your art. This is not a space to gather the mail or the laundry. This is a space to build and create. Go do that other stuff in another room. You've got plenty. Time to work means setting a time every day and going back to your work at that same time. When you do this, it trains your brain to have a habit of creativity so that inspiration knows when to strike rather than you waiting around for it to happen. Inspiration, after all, is a chemical reaction in our brain that is emotionally driven. And when we set time constraints around our emotional reactions, the body responds. So having your art practice at the same time helps you to be even more inspired. And have it. Repeat this every day, four or five days every week. That means go to your space at the same time and repeat it over and over and over again. And in terms of time, I recommend starting small. Just 15 minutes a day is all you need to dedicate to building your craft. I also find that often when I'm working for 15 minutes a day, I end up working for an hour or even longer because I'm so excited and having fun with my art. One of the ways to think about it, uh, and I have, I, I have my example right here. Um, I had the privilege of meeting the author Tyree Jones on a cruise ship, uh, having a cocktail with her one night, having lunch one day. It was really fun um, to talk to her, Oprah Book Club winner. Um, and she said uh, some wonderful advice for writers, but I think it, it's just practical for everybody. Um, it, just about chunking your, your practice, chunking the things that you want to do. And, and she says it this way, that if you write one page a day, by the end of the year, you have a novel. And anybody, anybody can write a page a day. And I just think that is um, really exciting and fun advice. So get out there and write your page a day. Get started. Uh, you can further enhance your inspiration potential by making your space and time work best for you. Some of the things that I like to do in my own practice are always have my tools ready. So if I'm going to work on a collage, I make sure that I have my knives, I have my paper, all of my stencils and products. They're ready right there at hand in my workstation so that I can go. Um, also, keep your workspace clear. Make sure that it is dedicated just to your art practice. Again, no mail, no laundry. Don't do your carrot shavings there at your work table. That's for the kitchen. Make sure you do it in those spaces. 
Uh, and give yourself five minutes to pick up every time you finish your practice for the day. It's just going to help you out in the long run because when you come back, you can instantly jump right back into that clean, clear workspace with your tools ready to go and there are no hindrances in your way. Make it easy for you to practice and you'll really enjoy it. So how else do we create inspiration? By connecting and by connecting creatively. Human beings, artists included, are social animals. And this means that our physiology is hardwired for interaction. In fact, inspiration, again, that emotional chemical reaction that makes us feel creative, uh, is often found in the interplay of relationships or how things relate in new and imaginative ways. So it makes sense that a key to nurturing your own inspiration is building and developing relationships of your own. Connecting then can be a very broad and personal activity. Because we're all different, we have to look at connecting in different ways. And for some, it might be the frenzy of the dance floor, which I know many of you are missing. For others, it might be mingling at an art gallery, which I'm certainly missing. Uh, it could also be cocktails with friends, holiday dinners with your family, or just communing out there with nature alone. All of these things are ways we can connect. For me personally, connecting is tied to the wind. I grew up in a box canyon out in the Antelope Valley on the edge of the Angeles National Forest. And the wind, based on the geology, even a small breeze would whistle, but a, a storm would moan through the night. And, and it's something that really just touched my heart as a boy and still carries with me. So whenever I feel a lack of connectedness, I just listen for the wind, listen for a breeze, and hope that the Santa Anas are going to come again, because they're just too much fun for a kid that grew up with the wind. So four ways that you can truly connect include exploring new things, expressing gratitude, complimenting others, and sharing stories. Exploring new things is really fun. And you can do this by looking at other artists' artwork, by asking questions about their work, and discovering meaning from another person's point of view. But you can also explore new things by going out and taking a walk. I recommend it. It's a great way to really expand what you're seeing and what inspires you. And when you go out on that walk, make sure that you're looking for new things, things you never noticed before. Try looking for two or three new things every time you take a step outside. Express gratitude. Gratitude is such a great way to really build up who you are. Uh, and, and the inspiration that's inside of you. Uh, I recommend every night you list three positive things that happen to you in your day before you go to bed. You can just run them through in your head. They don't have to be out loud. It doesn't need to be journaled. Just thinking about three things that happen to you over the course of the day that were positive are enough to keep you inspired and motivated and happy into the next day. Also with expressing gratitude is telling people that they make you happy. It's such a great way to show that you're having a good time and enjoying your art and who you are. And don't be afraid to brag. Part of expressing gratitude is acknowledging your accomplishments and being proud of them. So tell us about them. It's perfectly okay. Compliment others. This is a great thing about inspiration is that you can be inspired by helping others with their own practice and their own work. Um, I like to reach out and tell a handful of people every day something nice, whether it's about them personally, whether it's about their artwork. When you build a practice of complimenting others, you'll find that that comes back to you. It's almost karmic in its relationship. People become used to your interactions with them being kind and complimentary, and they respond in the same way. And getting those compliments really, really helps to develop your own inspired, creative self. 
And finally, share stories. Sharing stories is so amazing, right? Whether you're listening to others um, and listening to the stories that they tell, or whether you're answering questions, and I dare you to do this, I dare you to get out there and answer a question that somebody asks you with a story instead of a direct answer. It opens up pathways in the brain that create connections we might not normally observe. Also, I'm gonna put a shout out there to them. Read fairy tales, folk tales, myths, and legends. These things are pathways to soul language and they will inspire you. Do a little research, get a book from the library, read to the kids. All of this will help you grow your inspiration. So moving on to number four, how to stay inspired. Be sure that you are caring for yourself. One of the most important things required to really and truly find inspiration is to listen to your inner voice. What are your needs? Until those needs are met, you are always going to run into barriers towards inspiration. I know we all grew up with the idea, the mythic idea even, of the starving or the tortured artist, but ugh, I don't want to be starving, and I certainly don't want to be tortured. Those are not on my list of life goals, and they should not be on yours. Um, and in fact, I would argue that inspiration doesn't come from suffering, that inspiration comes from contentedness. Uh, and even though we have adages like inspiration, or invent, or, uh, what was, what's the phrase? Necessity, that's it. Necessity is the mother of invention. I would argue that these aren't true, that, that, that suffering and starvation, in fact, keep us from inspiration. If we have to struggle for basic needs, how is it that we can, we can yearn to create something outside of ourselves? We wouldn't even have the space to feel or to want that. Um, and I'm going to give Newton as a good example because it parallels to what we're, it sort of parallels to what we're going through now. Um, he invented calculus during numerous outbreaks to the plague. And I'm going to guarantee you that Sir Isaac Newton was not starved and was not suffering during these outbreaks. That in fact, the comfort and time, the ability to work gave him the space, the inspired space to create some of the most complex mathematics we know today. Ultimately, it's important to remember that good art starts with you. And in order to create good art, you need to care for yourself. Do this by being your own best friend. Treat yourself every once in a while to the things that you want and enjoy. And be sure to talk to yourself like a loved one be kind with your inner talk. Really be your personal best friend. Clean your room. And you're going to find when you clean your room, you're also cleaning your mind. A neat and orderly space helps the body and the mind to relax. Be sure to clean up after your projects because it makes it easier to start again when you're ready to begin your practice the next day. And one of my favorite things for taking care of myself is wearing what I love. Things that are comfortable, things that reflect who you are as a person. You should always, always be in a state where you are relaxed. And even when a dress code requires it, find a fit or style that's appropriate for the time, but also appropriate for your enjoyment. All right, finally, in order to stay inspired, the number one tip, the most important takeaway, make something, really make anything. Because a trick to staying inspired is to feed your creative mind. Just like other muscles or skills, inspiration grows stronger the more you use it. Writers, for example, know that the cure for writer's block is to just start writing. Even if what you produce is not great, 
it's better than not producing anything at all. And you can always iterate as you move forward. It's true for writers, it's true for film, it's true for photographers, it's true for painters. We can all iterate on our work as we move forward. Visual artists who are stuck, just like writers, you need to put down some colors. You need to start drawing on a page. All you have to do is start making marks to get moving. Once you make the first one, it'll give you direction on how to make your next creative move. Personally, I've been having a hard time getting inspired throughout all of this. Uh, I'm a little tired emotionally, um, and not surprising given the global circumstances and some of the attention that's required for my professional side and the gallery side. Um, and I'm also missing my spaces, my friends, my family, and even really missing my time alone, which I'm sure many of us are. Uh, but through it all, I kept my practice and I've kept working. And even though I wasn't super inspired, uh, I did uh, find that um, there was something in hummingbirds that was calling to me. And so I started exploring them first with a digital drawing, then with a, uh, some printing out on, uh, on some vintage paper. And I really was enjoying what was produced experimented with a watercolor sketch and that went well and then finally i produced uh the piece behind me which is joy uh, i'll move so you can give her a look there um, and joy is a three-dimensional collage piece meaning that the paper pieces are pinned floating above the canvas uh, and i really like uh what i produced because i came from a place of of really no purpose um, but I, I kept pushing forward, drawing on my iPad and playing around with the form that I had, had figured out and expanding on it through various iterations. Uh, and what I came away with is joy, which to me is this reflection of the time that we're going to, where we have segments of meaning and segments of beauty almost represented, uh, representative of us ourselves held apart over, literally floating over, the representational nostalgia of a world that is left behind, an old world. And so there are old maps layered underneath, old pieces of dictionary, um, some poetry from Emily Dickinson, layered underneath the, the support and the paint there in which the hummingbird is floating over. Uh, and I hope that a, a new world is waiting us on the other side, of course. So three ways you can get started making anything. Start a sketchbook um, and draw something new every day. The, your drawings don't have to be good. They don't have to be great. They don't have to be shown to anybody. What is really important is just that you're putting pencil or paint down to paper. Watercolor, color pencil, ink pen, these are all great mediums for starting an art journal. Uh, just watch your, your paper weights so that you're not using watercolor on a really light paper. You want thick paper for watercolors. But any kind of sketch journal is a great way to get motivated and moving. Another way, copy a great master. Pick one of your favorite paintings, and it could be contemporary, it could be historical, it doesn't matter. But pick a piece of artwork that's from a historical setting and copy it. Literally copy from top to bottom. Um, what you're gonna do while you do this is have fun because it's something that you love and enjoy, but you're also gonna develop your creative skills and get inspired to create things on your own. And finally, download an app. There's lots of choices out there. I recommend uh, Sketches Pro. Uh, it's available for both your uh, iOS platforms and for the Mac desktops. Um, but there are a variety of platforms that you can use for video art, photographic art, for drawing, painting, and etc. And these are things that can be done on your phone or tablet. They're no mess, and it makes your workspace, liter workspace 
portable to you. Um, so really get out there, have fun with a sketchbook, copying a great master, or downloading an app. So to recap, inspiration is a, an emotional muscle. The potential for inspiration is infinite. And to access it, you can organize and prioritize or identify and respond to the most important parts of your life and the vol at the volume that makes you feel best. You can create an art routine and make your art practice a daily habit so that inspiration knows when to strike you rather than you waiting around for inspiration to come. Three, connect creatively. Put yourself out there and connect with the world, whether it be artistically or through nature or through other human beings. Find connections. Four, care for yourself. Be your own best friend and be nice with that self-talk. And five, make something. Really make anything. Just get started. Inspiration comes faster for those who go looking for it. Thank you again for your time and for the honor of sharing these ideas with you. To all you artists and art lovers out there, I'm Kay Ryan Hennessy, and I am hoping that you stay inspired. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kayla Lynn Clunan, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist living in Los Angeles, California. So my studio work varies. Uh, I originally went to school for a degree in painting, uh, and I work mostly in abstraction across the board. But I also work in performance art. Uh, I do, I've done some installations, uh, drawing, mixed media. I've been experimenting a lot with video art uh, as of late. I'm just really interested in exploring all kinds of mediums, uh, depending on what the idea is. And I, I would say that most of my work revolves around personal, intimate scenarios and experiences. I work a lot with the ideas of memory and past traumas and uh, just a, a general sort of personal exploration in my work. I've been in a variety of group and solo shows. I've done a lot of collaborative work. I've curated a few shows here in LA um, and I've worked with all kinds of different established and alternative spaces. Uh, just this last year I had nine performances that I did. Uh, a few of them, uh, some of the notable galleries for those were uh, Gallery 825 from the Los Angeles Art Association for which I'm doing my third year as a member with them. Um, and Tag Gallery, which is a artist collab gallery over in Miracle Mile. Uh, so I've done a performance with them. I've uh, showed some video and some paintings. It's a really great space. Um, and then Live Laugh Loft, uh, which is a brand new space that just opened up last year for uh, performance, dance, and music. Um, so I've, I've worked with a lot of interesting spaces. I, I like to kind of keep my eye out for fun projects of any kind. I love working with other artists. And I want to start by taking a moment to thank the city of Santa Clarita for reaching out to me to talk about what it's like to be an artist during the COVID-19 pandemic. So quarantine has been many things for many people. It's been a lot of events and emotions. And for me, uh, my coping mechanism is my art. I work through a lot of personal situations through my work, and uh, as of yet, it has been uh, a positive experience for me. I've been trying to work on projects as much as possible and keep busy, um, and so it's it's been an interesting experience. So I actually started out uh, 2020, weirdly enough, with a, a year-long project, year-long daily project, um, and this, of course, was before I knew any of this kind of crazy stuff was going to happen. But I was basically challenging myself. I was interested in doing a project that uh, involved self-reflection and uh, just a general daily mindfulness. Uh, I have a tendency to get a little carried away with lots of, uh, 
lots of events and projects and kind of over overload myself. Um, so I wanted a project that would bring me back to uh, uh, a, a commitment of a daily practice and also to encourage a sense of play and, and to kind of move myself away from uh, a tendency towards some level of like perfection that sometimes uh, is an overthought thing. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing is uh, telling myself it doesn't have to be good, it just has to be done. Um, and so for this project, uh, I gave myself a few parameters of the things that I had to do every day. And so I make a 10 by 6 inch painting um, and I write myself a letter that I've been sealing up in envelopes to look at at the end of the year. I do a sketch in a sketchbook or a page in a sketchbook. Um, I actually hand bound a, a series of 12 months worth of sketchbooks with the exact amount of pages for each month. So that's been very interesting. Some days it's just scribbles, but like I said, it's, it's, it's more about the doing and the feeling in the moment uh, than it is about making a good or a perfect piece. Um, and then I've also been uh, working in 35 millimeter film for the first time in a long time. And I've been doing a self portrait every day uh, in film. And so I can't look at it yet. I don't know what it looks like. Uh, and uh, I have like an extended shutter release. So I can't, I can't really see uh, whether or not it is in focus. Um, so it's been an interesting experiment. And then the last one kind of came a little bit uh, later, like uh, about, I think it was about a couple of weeks into the year, I came up with a, a fifth element, which is to do uh, a series of books of blackout poetry. Um, so that was a fun little addition. And that one I kind of do a little more sporadically. <clears throat> but the other uh, four elements I do every day. Uh, and that's kind of gotten me in a really interesting schedule that uh, kind of helped keep my life together when I started self-quarantining. It's a very important element to uh, everything that's been happening. So the first project that I want to talk about that I started right at uh, my self-quarantining um, is a series of blindfolded paintings. So there's an interesting history to this one. Um, I was actually in a show at Shockbox Gallery in Hermosa Beach. Um, God, it wasn't even that long ago. I think it was actually in February that the reception was, like right before everything happened. Uh, and it was, it was an interesting combination. The show was called Intergalactic Open. Uh, so it had all kinds of different submissions in it. And I had a piece that was accepted that was actually uh, elements of a past performance. So I've been doing a lot of stuff where I take some of the remnants of the performances that I've done, uh, the sheets and uh, different uh, pieces of paints and, and, and accumulations and uh, created work with, with those elements. And for this one, it was one in particular that I, I took it, it was a sheet that had been painted on from a performance and I took it and I stretched it. Uh, on a frame and I just decided that it was done um, and te technically in the past or at least all the other ones I've done so far I was pretty heavy into the idea of adding an additional layer. Um, I do tend to work in uh, cyclical motions where I kind of will uh, lay down a layer and come back to it months sometimes even years later and kind of change it and add to it and uh, create that kind of atmospheric depth. But for this one, I just felt like, I felt like the energy was there. Um, and so I gave it a shot. I submitted it and it got accepted. Uh, so that definitely got me thinking about uh, the, the ideas of, of memory and of moment and of immediacy and the fact that when I made that painting, it was essentially a painting I made without trying to make a painting. So I was kind of having all these ideas uh, in relation to that. And when I was at the reception, uh, I met uh, this artist named Ashton Phillips, whose sculpture was actually on display next to my work. And it was also abstract, and it was also playing with material. Um, 
and we kind of got to talking a little bit and uh, he suggested to me why don't you try painting with your eyes closed and I thought I'm gonna do that that's a great idea I'm gonna do that so accelerate a little bit forward uh, uh, one of the last performances I actually did before the pandemic started uh, was a piece called uh, Anonymous Letters to a Stranger um, at Create World's first pop-up exhibit in LA. Um, and it was, it was a very interesting project. It was probably the most audience involvement focus piece I'd ever done. And it was inspired by Marina Abramovich's The Artist is Present. And essentially, for both of the performances, I sat for three hours unmoving, blindfolded, and covered in a sheet. And I had a setup inviting people to come and write letters. Um, and I suggested, I had signs that suggested it could be to a stranger, it could be to the artist, it could be to yourself in the future or the past, uh, it could be to somebody you wish you could write a letter to. Uh, but, but the experience of being blindfolded for that amount of time and uh, w was so like such a crazy physical and mental experience that you know I just tied all those things together and <clears throat> ended up doing my first series in quarantine called uh, Going Blindly into the Future uh, and they, they are paintings that I made blindfolded and I use the same blindfold and I kind of cut the sheet from that performance to use as like almost like a smock um, and uh, it's it really is an interesting accumulation on its own that piece of fabric that I was kind of wearing um, but I was channeling all those different things and it originally started as an idea for a performance for a live stream performance uh, online which it was the first time I had ever done a live stream anything. Um, I, I tend to be pretty minimal with my involvement online. Uh, it's, it's became more important to me since the quarantine and it kind of, it all makes sense to me now as a way to reach out. Um, so so that's, that's been a, an interesting development. <clears throat> but basically I set up my camera and I set up all my paints and my brushes and everything. Uh, not too different than how I set up normally painting I typically decide on my palette ahead of time and kind of set some stuff up and give myself some boundaries um, to work within and but this time I, I blindfolded myself and I, I did the whole painting blindfolded and uh, it was such a strange experience it was it was extremely cathartic and honestly when I took the blindfold off I laughed <laughs> I laughed when I looked at the painting because it was just not at all what I imagined it would be it was so strange looking and so like just covered in more paint than I ever normally use and I mean there was there were so many colors happening it I, I gotta admit it's not my favorite of the bunch but uh, but it but it was like the experience itself was so powerful that I decided to continue it as a series and so far I've done five uh, right now and it's just because that's you know what happened to be the material that I had that would fit on the stretcher and um, so I build all of my own frames and uh, behind me is actually the frame that I used for the blindfolded paintings and they're they're all uh, they're 74 by 47 so they're pretty big uh, but it gave me a good space to kind of work around um, because I, I wanted it to I, I wanted to kind of immerse myself in a performative state of mind uh, because of the fact that that previous painting uh, that had such an energy to it had was from the energy of performing. It was from the energy of the focus that comes with performing. That's kind of a different mindset than the way that I typically uh, imagine when I'm painting. So it was, it was a powerful experience and, and it's bizarre to see like the different paintings along the way like they have definitely changed along the way like I modify the palettes a little bit depending on the color of the fabric and the material that I'm using um, but I'm just working with the paints that I have um, kind of exhausting whatever materials that I have access to because it's all I have right now 
Uh, so I'm trying to use that in a positive way to kind of uh, create continuity between uh, the work that I'm making. But I've also been exploring with each one, I've, I'm, I'm like, I feel like I've been getting a little deeper into what it means to cut off one of my senses. Um, and also getting closer to this feeling that I have been having pretty much since I got laid off of my day job, which is insecurity and, and, and a literal blindness into the future because I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, so I've been trying to channel that in the most positive way that I can. And the blindfolded paintings were a very important element for helping me kind of push through uh, those first two weeks. And speaking of the first two weeks, the other project that really kept me in contact with the community, because, you know, we're, we're all isolated. I mean, a lot of the work that I have been doing is is pretty personal stuff, and it, it is in isolation. I'm, I, I haven't seen anyone in person for a long time other than occasionally on a walk. Um, so, and with everything canceled, I was... And I've been missing a lot of people. And so those first two weeks, uh, actually, I think it actually happened the day after I found out I got laid off is I got, um, is I saw that there was a call um, by Christine Schumacher. So Christine Schumacher is this incredible artist, uh, phenomenal community member. She's such a sweetheart. She's got amazing ideas. And she's, she's always been about like holding the glue together of people uh, in, in the art community here in Los Angeles. And I feel like this project even went way beyond LA. Um, she really let the call be out to anyone because it was a digital project. And so uh, she's doing this through Shoebox PR. Um, and so there's a whole team for Shoebox PR that's been kind of coming up with the idea for this and working on the, putting the project together and everything. And uh, the project was called Call and Response. And it essentially it was collaboration at a distance. And it was kind of inspired by uh, traditional jazz and exquisite corpse and just this idea of the back and forth collaboration between two artists. And uh, she randomly paired people together. There were, I think there were almost a hundred artists in the first round, which was crazy. Um, and I got randomly paired with artist Misty Mon in Virginia, uh, who from what I can see does mostly portraiture, uh, figurative work. Um, they're beautiful, subtle paintings. They're gorgeous. You should look, you should look her up. Um, but it was really interesting because I feel like in the beginning we were just kind of doing our own thing that we were doing anyway. Like I sent her a couple of abstract pieces. She sent back a portrait. Misty got me totally out of my comfort zone. Like I started using myself as an image, like doing self portraiture where I was uh, getting back into photography. Like I, I got into some digital art. I was using myself uh, in, in videos, which I typically uh, stay pretty abstract and non-representational. Um, and so it was, it was really great. It was a great collaboration. And then of course, at the end of the two weeks, uh, the team at Shoebox PR uh, arranged a online artist reception, uh, which was pretty cool. And there was something like 60 plus people uh, that were in the reception. It was really cool to see everyone's faces. And then of course she did the show online uh, on the blog where she put up everybody's work and everything so that you could kind of see the evolution of everyone's collaborations and it was it was really great it really helped me through those first couple of weeks and right now i'm actually in round two of the project uh, and i've been paired with artist elizabeth flinch in minnesota and uh, i could i could definitely feel in the beginning like there was, there was a, a real obvious tension of like, you know, we've, we've been in quarantine for like a month now, like there was a little bit of like, you know, like a little bit of hopelessness, like a little bit of like concern for the future, but I really feel like we inspired each other um, in a positive way. Like uh, the work that we've been ma making as of yet or, uh, has really became interesting. Like uh, Elizabeth seems to do primarily photography 
and she's been branching out and doing video and even working with clay, um, which has been inspiring for me as well. I did a recent piece that involved clay. Um, and uh, for me in particular is that uh, when I saw Elizabeth had actually posted uh, about developing film at home in her bathroom, and it just, like, it was like, ding, it, it, it just hit me right there, like, I should be developing my film from my daily project, because I've been working in 35 millimeter film and taking a self-portrait every day, and it just dawned on me, like, I could do that at home, and uh, so I ordered the chemicals. I even got in contact with my old uh, photo teacher from high school uh, who is sending me this glorious box of goodies with all the equipment that I need to develop my film and everything. And, and I'm just over the moon. I'm so excited to, to get back into film photography again. It's been since like 2009 that I've worked in film. So I'm pretty excited for that. And. You know, that really came on from uh, seeing Elizabeth's uh, scanned 120 film images that she's been sending me. They're just so lovely. I mean, ah, it's such a nostalgia for me. It's, it's a great process to work with, and I'm just really excited to be doing that. And I've already signed up for round three, <laughs> uh, which is supposed to be starting sometime in May. Um, so I'm just going to keep the ball rolling. I, I think it's... I just think it's imperative uh, to have some kind of like structure that's happening and for me of course I've, I've been at home so uh, I've been pretty much full-time in the studio and uh, I'm, I'm using the time the best I can and uh, really enjoying reaching out to people and being involved in collaborations and stuff uh, it's 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 been good I feel like people are really coming together positively in this time of crisis, you know, people are really trying to use the time to the, to the best of their ability. So the next project I want to talk about that I've been doing, uh, or that I did in quarantine, is a really weird one. Uh, maybe one of the weirdest things I've ever done, I'm not sure. Um, but I decided, uh, since I uh, only have access to things that are around me in my neighborhood, so I haven't left my neighborhood for a couple of months now. Uh, but this was still pretty early on, was like a couple weeks in, I decided to do uh, what I called a site-specific quarantine show. And basically what I did is, I've always been really obsessed with the LA River um, and the fact that there's like these giant concrete walls along the side that are so empty. And I always imagined like, wow, there should be like murals painted there, or there should be like art somehow hanging there. and. So um, I'm actually, I'm in Highland Park, so the Arroyo Seco River is just up the street from me. Um, and it's one of the smaller rivers that feeds into the LA River. And it's still got a similar setup, just a little smaller, so it's still got the bike path and everything. And so I decided to put on this art show that people could social distance visit. So I chose seven paintings, uh, four of which are actually the first four blindfolded paintings and then the other three from a series from the end of last year. And uh, I decided to call the show Off the Frame uh, because I took the paintings, just the fabric of the painting, so no wood frames or anything. And I went out there and I took double-sided foam tape and adhered them to the walls and kind of curated how, uh, the spacing and everything. And uh, I printed out little labels for each of the paintings with the information on them and I had a little sign for the show and a sign with my name on it. And, uh, and my partner helped me put this together. We lived together. And uh, he also came and joined me for the online reception. So I did like a little Instagram live online reception uh, where we popped open a bottle of champagne and toasted a glass to the show. And, uh, and I, I walked along the wall and talked about the work that was on display. Uh, and the basis of the project was that I was going to hang the work and leave it up there for seven days for a full week and that each day I would go back and do a Instagram live with updates of what had changed because you know when you leave art in public that's unmonitored you know I was curious to see what happened to it was it gonna blow away was it gonna be stolen was it gonna be graffiti I don't know I was, I was kind of interested in it as a social experiment too and 
so uh, I released the address of the of where the paintings were located and how to get to them on the bike path after I did the reception and uh, and then every day I went back for updates so like the first day like one of the paintings had fallen off the wall and some of them were kind of blowing uh, from the wind and then like the second day all the paintings had fallen to the ground and two of them were missing and uh, on the fifth day all of the paintings were gone completely gone no like the only remnants were just the foam pieces of tape on the wall with the little labels uh, and so that that ended up being the end of the show uh, prematurely but I kind of expected that to happen and you know I I'm, I'm interested in the idea that those paintings have some new life now and uh, in some fashion <laughs> uh, but it's kind of neat I mean I've had a lot of moments in my life where I've, I've I, like I've moved a lot in my adult life I mean I moved a lot in my childhood too but um, I, I've lost a lot of work over the years I've either had to leave it behind or throw it away or uh, or whatever it is and so for me this was this was like a, a cathartic uh, project because I I was I could let them go, decide to let them go. Um, so that was really, that was a really great experience. Uh, and I hope somebody got to see them while they were up. Uh, it did look pretty cool. Uh, thankfully, I took some, some videos and some photos of it set up and everything. So, so it, it definitely evolved. It was, it was really neat to watch. It kind of became more of an installation. Uh, which I love. I mean, I love the idea of something being effect affected over time, you know, the ephemerality of that. Um, but I will say probably the most bizarre thing that happened with the Quarantine Art Show is that the day that I put it up and the, the day that I had the reception, we were walking back up from the river and, and decided to walk on this street that we don't normally walk on, going up to the local 7-Eleven. And there was like a bunch of abstract paintings hanging on the fence along the street and we were just like what and so I, I kind of started like filming them and this lady in the middle of the street was like hey the artist lives over there and so we crossed the street and lo and behold uh, she happens to be outside and uh, she just starts talking to me about her paintings like and that she uh, she had them set up and she was calling it the drive-by art show and it was just like amazing you know like I just thought that was so cool like right after I had set up mine in the river it was like we were, we were in the same like zone you know it was really cool and the fact that she's an abstract painter like right around the corner from me and I didn't even know she was there um, it was just amazing and her, and her name is uh, Olivia Arthur um, you should check her out too great stuff uh, but yeah, it was just like, it was so serendipitous, like, oh my god, <laughs> what? And I think that's one of the things that's kept me going with all this, is like, the, the community efforts, is seeing, seeing other people, like, really try to put it out there somehow, and come up with new creative ways to share what, whatever it is they're doing. I mean, that's, you know, we gotta do that right now. We can't see each other in person, so, <laughs> you know, we gotta figure out some way to, to keep the energy going and keep the positivity going creative you know it's good stuff and so I guess the last series I want to talk about um, that's also related to quarantine is a series that I've been calling whiteout and so uh, this one's a little bit more of like looking back and kind of uh, which feels like a long time ago at this point like my life has changed so much that it's it's almost odd to like look back not even you know you know just a few months ago it's like December 2019 feels like forever ago now <laughs> feels like a whole year um, so I decided to take all of my paintings from pre-quarantine and do a series where I painted over them in variations of white and so I haven't solidified like the <laughs> final presentation for these pieces yet um, so I just kind of have like sort of like unedited kind of images on my website but um, essentially like what ended up happening is that uh, as I started doing them 
you know, because I'm only using the, the paints and supplies that I have on hand. So as I started doing them, it's like the first ones are like a pure white. And then as I run out of the white, it becomes like a, a light gray and then like cream colored. And, and so I love to like see the evolution over time of like the slight variations of white as they evolve um, has been very interesting. I think I've I think I've got like 12 pieces in that series right now. Um, and I'm still working on like, I mean, this has been an interesting time for me because I have so much time to work on stuff. So I've actually been able to like uh, go through some of my stuff in the studio, like go through some of my storage and like find paintings I forgot about or like bits and pieces of surfaces and supplies I forgot I had. And so I, I'm still kind of like digging stuff up and figuring out what I'm gonna do with them and everything. So, so there might be more added to that series. Uh, and if I find any more pieces of fabric that fit on that big stretcher, I'll, I'll probably do more blindfolded paintings too. Um, but I just really, I like the big stretchers. So I want to, I want to do it, I want to do it big because the, the, the physical experience of working big is, is something that I love. And I just feel like the blindfolded paintings need to be, they need to be big. <laughs> um, so if there's anything that you take away from this video, this artist talk, uh, it should be to keep creating, no matter what that means, you know? Like, in addition to making art, I've been cooking every day, I've taught myself how to bake bread, like, I, you know, all, all kinds of projects. Like, for me, managing anxiety means keeping busy, it means having projects and uh, having things to, to explore and complete. Uh, but the most important thing is that all coping mechanisms are valid. Whatever you need to do to stay safe, sane, and positive is the way to go. Um, and so I, I hope you keep exploring self-expression, making art, baking bread, whatever it is. Just keep doing it, keep positive, keep creating, and uh, you know, Keep at it. It's gonna. It's, everything is gonna be okay, and we're all gonna come out on the end of this better. And uh, it's gonna be good. So, again, I want to thank the city of Santa Clarita. Uh, it's been a pleasure. My name is Kayla Lynn Clunan, and uh, stay safe, guys. show you different materials to start your stencils. So if you're at home and you want to figure out how to make some stencils, do some designs on your artwork, um, this is an easy way to get started. So I'm, I'm going to start the video by just showing you some materials that you can use. Um, some you might have at home. You can just use regular paper or cardboard. Um, but I want to show you what, what I use and what I recommend to use. So, um, if you're just using simple stencils, this is a piece I made um, using these stencils just out of paper, out of thick paper. It was a mixed media pad of paper that I just ripped out. So it was about 80 pounds or thicker. So that gives you a little bit more sturdiness. So. Um, you can use that, that's one option. I use that sometimes, I don't do it all the time. If it's just quick stencils that I don't think I'm really gonna use a lot, um, then I'll just do that. So I made these specifically for this painting. So I just cut them out. I don't, maybe I'll use them again. I sprayed them multiple times as you can see. Um, so they were good for like multi-use, but they're not going to be very durable. They're not going to last too long. So I prefer, here's some other ones. Um, I prefer to use this oil board. It's very thick. It's durable. It's reusable. Um, you can wipe, wipe off after you're done, after you spray. So um, yeah, I, I really prefer this. It comes in long, uh, really big sheets, so you can cut to whatever you're looking for, and um, you can you can still get really good detail. Um, 
But yeah, I prefer the oil board for reusable stencils that you're going to make. It's just, you're, if you're home, you're not going to have this at home. So I wanted to offer um, the option of using using paper, cardboard, cardstock is even a really good option because it gives you that thick, um, like a little bit more sturdiness. So um, in the next video, I'm going to show you more about these stencils that I make. So I learned this technique to do um, reusable stencils this way, and it's paper and it's window screen, and you glue them together and you get this really durable, um, reusable stencil. So I use this also on this, um, I use this stencil on this painting as well. And um, this is something very different. There's a lot more steps involved, and I'm gonna show you that in the next video. So for, for material, I would think about a thick, cardstock or a thick paper. Um, if you can get the oil board, I would get it. I can put links and information below. Um, but any, most uh, art stores will have it. I would just not go to Michael's or anything like that because they do not. So um, get yourself a bunch of X-Acto knives. Um, or you just need one knife and a bunch of blades. Make sure to um, change out your blades. And if you are printing on um, paper and you wind up using the oil board or even the thicker paper, you can print out like on computer paper and, and spray it, spray adhesive it onto like a thicker paper or even cardstock or your cardboard if you wind up doing that. And sometimes, yeah, I, I spray that onto the oil board. It works out really well. So if you, I just wanted to show you the uh, 77 uh, spray that you would use for that. So um, there you go. Pretty simple to get started. And um, the next video will show you more about cutting the stencil. Thank you. Much else. Um, 
the idea is that it's going to be sprayed on here, but then it's going to peel off. So um, let's do that. You only need like a light spray, and I use uh, the 77 spray. You can use like the 3M removable um, adhesive also. So, not terrible, but that's pretty good. Um, you just need a spray, you know, a spray adhesive. But this is the one I like. But this one you can, uh, you can spray too much and then it's so good that it'll hold really well. So right now you just need like a light, light spray. So you're going to stick that on. If you have never, um, I call it spray mount, spray mounted um, anything on to um, a board, any like foam board or anything before, um, I would play around with that, do that a few times with things that are small. So you get the idea um, because you don't want any bubbles. If you if you have any bubbles, then it's going to be really tough um, to get a really clean stencil. So you can see that this is very flat. There's no bubbles, no wrinkles, no nothing. Um, so that that's when you know you're good to go. Usually, if it's a larger piece. Say I was doing this whole this whole piece, I would um, put the paper down and go from the middle out on one side and from the middle out on the other side to flatten it. So that's just things that you have to play with depending on the size of your image. But since this one is very small, we can go ahead and start cutting. So, step three is going to be, now you can cut. So, the paper is stuck to your wood, and now you need to get your X-Acto knife. So, um, make sure that the blade is sharp. You have extra blades, because if there's a lot of cutting, you do need to change the blade once in a while. So, make sure to know how to do that. Um, and I'm gonna start cutting here. All the black, you want to keep all the white um, part and then you're going to cut everything out that is black. So, um, yeah, so I can start doing that. Step three, finished. So that, now your piece is all cut out. It's getting windy so I put this on top, but um, let me show you. We don't need our X-Acto knives anymore. Um, so this is, this is your piece, all cut out. Um, next step, Make sure your screen is clean. What's going on? Okay. You're gonna spray the paper with your spray again. So what this is gonna do is attach to your window screen. Again, you need it completely flat. Completely flat. So you push out all the bubbles that might come up. If you need more glue, you know, I, I don't need any, but 
lift it up and then flat spray it and flatten it again. No problem. That's easy peasy. But that is just going to hold it in place. And the next step, step four, well, I guess that's step four. Step five is glue. So this is just white, just white glue. Elmer's school glue, whatever, whatever you want. Um, so now you're going to adhere the screen to the paper using the glue. Okay, step five, glue that works. Um, sometimes I have trouble with the caps, keeping them clean. So yeah, just try and get some glue that cap is good, works, because if you're doing like a really large piece and they're squeezing it, which I have done before, too hard, your hand will feel it. It doesn't need to be that difficult. This is, um, this is going to be connecting the screen all the screen pieces to the paper and this is going to dry and then you'll have a really good sturdy stencil but um anything that you cut out that's still live that's still there you're going to have to put glue on so if you did a really tiny piece which i have a bunch of little little pieces the goal is not to get glue uh, on the open parts of the screen that doesn't have paper that does not have paper so um, you want to be very careful with how you're applying glue not to get it too close to the edges and um, if you have really tiny tiny spots you kind of have to be careful like this glue um, I can tell that this glue top it's like a little too wide like not too wide it's just I probably cut it or something to open it more but greatest for like small little small pieces. So you kind of have to be quick. Just you know put little bits. Try not to forget any pieces. Um, just glue all the paper that you left. So that's going to come up when you're done. All this glue is going to dry. And then you should be able to just peel up your stencil. Nails were so small. I just have to be careful around there. You want to get all the outer edge too of the whole entire piece. Um, I know it doesn't seem like you need it, but you do just to keep it sturdy. And um, And like on, the, on this piece, you can tell, I mean, you can't see, obviously you can't see any of the glue. So that all dries, you won't even see it. This is 
just white Elmer's glue. I think this is even school glue. too close to the edge, you go right next to the edge, okay? Don't go too close to the edge. Um, and make sure you get around the hand really well. Okay. So there you go. Let's wait for this to dry. We'll peel her up. Okay, great. So we have our stencil. It's dry now. We put the glue on it dried. Um, and now you can peel it off. So because you put the primer on, you put the glue on, it's going to now peel up. And you just have to make sure that all your little pieces still stay. Got all the glue on there really well, and sometimes I lift it like this to peel it up. And now you have a really sturdy, really beautiful uh, stencil that you can reuse that you can spray. So these work with spray paint. You can't really paint through these. Um, but this is uh, reusable for spray paint and just um, make sure that you wipe them off after you're done. And uh, next video will be me spraying this onto a piece of wood that, uh, the painting that I'm going to make. So here you go.
this dry. It should only take a few minutes. But um, this is the final piece.